What is a paradigm? Yes. And once you get entrenched in a way of thinking, and we have been entrenched in a way of thinking, have we not? Mm -hmm. And what paradigm have we been entrenched in? The functional. the functional paradigm. How did you like that way of thinking? Was that good? Yeah, I've, yeah actually, I've had a lot of you guys come by and say how well you like Dr. Rackett and the functional paradigm, and yeah, I think it's good. But then what happens is, when you get to the end of one paradigm, and you have to go to another one, what's that called? When you have to all of a sudden change to a whole different way of thinking, what's that called? Paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. So here we are, sports fans, about to experience our first paradigm shift. No, actually we experienced a paradigm shift when we started the functional. So that was one paradigm shift. But now we're going to our second paradigm of this course. And it is, as you see on this slide, it is the declarative slash logic paradigm, right? And the programming language that we are going to learn in order to investigate this paradigm is PROLOG, which stands for Programming with Logic, or pro Programming for Logic, or something like that. <laughs> so that's pro Now, let's compare, let's take a look a little bit at what we had done before in the functional paradigm. Actually, I only put one little attribute up here of the functional paradigm. One of the things, one of the main things about the functional paradigm is there was no assignment statement. What were some of the other characteristics of the functional paradigm now that we're, now that we can kind of look back and review it. Do you remember some of the things that were interesting or different in the functional par paradigm from the, from the normal, the, um, imperative paradigm that we're used to, an object-oriented paradigm. Remember, what, what a, not only did it have no assignment statement, but what else was about it? No, no call by reference. Everything was called by value. value. And so, you know, whenever you had to return the tree with the thing inserted in it, you had to make a whole new tree and return a copy of the whole new tree with the thing in it. So, so everything was called by value, no call by... And what, what was another one you said? No loops. No loops. All the repetition was with recursion. And, and not only that, but what about functions? You could treat functions, functions. Could be parameters. Yeah, you can, actual yeah, actual parameters. Yeah, you can pass functions as parameters. And, and everything was, and what does LISP stand for? List. list processing. And so all of our, the whole, language, scheme or lisp, the whole thing, they were lists, right? So it was parentheses and then the operator and then the operands. Yeah? Okay, so that was the functional paradigm. No assignment statement plus all these other attributes we just mentioned. And now you guys, guess what? Not only, we're going to take this one step further, not only are we going to like, you know, like scheme or Lisp, Prolog has no assignment statement, but guess what? Now not only are we going to do away with assignment statements, there's no program. <laughs> there's going to be no programming. Well, I take it back. Well, you'll see. <laughs> now, this is quite a, this is, this really does, I'm telling you guys, this one is a bigger paradigm shift, I think, than the other one, than functional. We're taking it one step further. Not only are there no assignment statements, but this is kind of like, actually, the declarative paradigm is very functional. I mean, some people would, call, would say that it is a, that it is one of the functional paradigms, but it's more than that. It is functional. It is functional in that there's no assignment statement and there's no loops and all that stuff. That part of it is the same. But the amazing thing about the declarative slash logic paradigm is that there is literally no program. Now, you guys know in C++, what's the difference between an HPP file and a CPP file? The HPP file is called a what? 
the header file and the CPP files is the source, right? The, where the actually code that does the stuff. And typically what happens is, not always, but typically what happens is the HPP file is for the specification and the CPP file is for the implementation. Now you guys all understand the difference between the, a specification and an implementation, right? So what does the... What does the specification tell you? Does it say what or how? Exactly. You're exactly right. It says what. The specification says what but not how. Whereas the implementation says what? How. So guess what? How? So, exactly. <laughs> exactly how. <laughs> no, 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 wait. No, in prolog... Wait, wait. In prolog, which one do we do away with? How? So, you sh so in prologue, what is the word? What? It's what? It's all we have. So here's what it says. It's specification without the implementation. How in the world can that be? By the way, I just updated these slides. Uh, if you've already downloaded them, you might want to re-download the slides. I, I've just made a few minor changes uh, just today. But as with the previous one um, paradigm, I've got a set of slides and a set of notes. Okay? And the slides, by the way, are all done for this one. I'm not going to be making them up. So if you want to download them all now, you can. But uh, there's a couple of uh, chapters. I haven't done the notes yet. Okay. <clears throat> so using Prolog. Now, here's, here's, the, here's I have an, uh, some bad news for you guys. Unfortunately, we do not have a nice Dr. Racket type of IDE for Prolog. Now, what's, what's an IDE? Integrated Development Environment. Exactly. It's an Integrated Development Environment. So, you know, um, we're going to use a really good command line version of it, of Prolog. It's, it's, we're going to use GNU Prolog. And... Um, but what it means, because we don't have an IDE, you, you're going to kind of miss it somehow. So here's the thing. What an IDE does is it gives you, you know, like one thing, one little part of the window, one pane to, to do the programming and another one to do the run, you know. Well, we don't have that. Is all we have is, so here's what I recommend you do. What I recommend you do is you have an editor. You, you have two, two windows open at the same time on your computer. And you have an editor where you can type your program and save it. And then you have a shell that's running the GNU prolog on the, on the other one. And as a matter of fact, I even have a specific uh, uh, recommendation. There is a text editor that's very, very old. But it is really good and it comes standard with all Unix and Linux implementations and there is there are versions for it it's called vim on windows it's also well there's two words for it vi and another one is vim and uh, it's a it's a hacker it's a programmer's it it's a it's a programmer's text editor it has kind of a steep learning curve to learn it is kind of difficult but once you learn it it's really fast because there's no mousing around everything is right on the keyboard and you can do stuff really, really fast. And I've had students who have, uh, who have taken me up on this suggestion and have gone to grad school and industry, and they say, wow, I sure am glad I know how to use Vibe, you know, because they find that it's a very useful tool. It might seem arcane and hard to learn, but trust me, if you, if you um, take the time to learn it, it, it's a valuable tool because it's standard. It comes with all Linux and Unix it comes VI VI stands for visual uh, visual yeah VI stands for visual editor and VIM is I forget what this one is M. visual oh, I forget but anyway I even have a I have a I have a um, command lines I have a, a command summary for VI on the web page if you want and you can there's lots of tutorials online um, but so what I recommend you do is if you don't do that, then you can use something like, what's the text editor for Windows? Notepad. Notepad. You could actually have Notepad open 
on one you know on one window and then and then run run uh, GNU Prolog on the you know in a console window, and then you could save you know with Notepad and you know or or whatever text editor you want you know it's okay but unfortunately we don't have this um, we don't have I haven't found a really good um, IDE for this and I I like GNU so it's it's a it's a really solid uh, implementation and they're always up to date. I mean, they're, they're, they, it keeps being maintained. It's a really good package. So anyway, that's the story and uh, behind how to use Prolog. Now, um, <clears throat> now what we're going to do is um, we're going to do we're going to start our exploration of um, Prolog with this figure 1.1 from. Oh, from chapter one of the book. And by the way, here's the book. It's Pro, uh, Prologue Programming for Artificial Intelligence by Bratko. I think we've, have you, do you guys all have this now? Okay, if you, if you don't, if you don't have, if it hasn't come yet, I think I, I can give you a copy of the first chapter or two if you want. But I, you should all have it by now. And uh, we're not going to cover near, you know, I think we're only going to cover like the first six chapters of this. We don't have, we won't be able to cover the whole thing. But Prolog, both Prolog and Lisp, or Scheme, those are the two lingua franca. You know, they, those are the, the programming languages for artificial intelligence. And so, the, and so the subtitle of this is Prolog Programming for Artificial Intelligence. So if you learn your Prolog from this book, then, and, you, and you're interested in continuing on to learn artif AI, some AI principles, it's a really good book. It's in its fourth edition now. Um, and so this figure 1.1 is from the first chapter. We're going to cover the first chapter today. And what kind of a what kind of a relationship does this look like on this figure one point one? In fact, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna reproduce it on the board here. Pam, what does it look like? Does anybody I'm gonna take a stab? Tom, what does it look like? It is. What do you suppose these? Here, what do you suppose? What do you suppose this arrow represents between Pam and Bob? Oh, that's a good, that was a good guess. Pam knows Bob. It's actually Pam is the parent of Bob. So this is a family tree. Are you with me? And then Tom is the father of Bob, is the parent of Bob. Tom is also the parent of Liz. And then Bob is the parent of Ann. And notice that these are lowercase. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then Bob is also the parent of Pat. And then Pat is the parent of Jim. Okay, so what, uh, we're going to start our we're going to start learning Prolog by using this example from Chapter One of the book. And what and here's how here's what this is the visual representation of the of this family tree. And here is how that vi this vi this uh, relationship is stored in Prolog, in the Prolog database. So now, what do we say we're doing away with in Prolog? Not only is there no assignment statement, there's no what? There's no program. So we're not going to program this stuff. What we're going to do is we're just going to say what is the case, and we're not going to say how. So what we are declaring here, these are called facts. Now, what's the shape of a prologue fact? It says parent, Pam, comma, Bob. And so what, is that, what, what meaning does that have to us? It doesn't have any meaning to the computer, but what meaning does it have to us? We interpret that as what? Pam parent, yes. Pam is the parent of Bob. So when you see parent, Pam, Bob, just read it, intersperse. Say, when it says parent, Pam, Bob, read it like Pam is the parent of Bob. So parent, Tom, Bob is Tom is the parent of Bob. Okay, does everybody see what I'm saying? And furthermore, each one of these facts, and what is the shape of a, of a fact? It has a, a name in the front, and then a parentheses, and then the arguments, and the arguments are separated by commas. Are you with me? And note that all of these start lowercase. That's necessary. And not only that, but they all end with a what? They end with a period. Okay? So, what we're, so now, what, we go, what you do is, the way, the way to get the results from a prologue 
system, I hate to call it a program, a prolog system is you just put the facts in there. You just put those facts in there and prolog will do all the processing to query the facts. So sometimes it's, 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 it's called the prolog database, right? You can think of this as being the database of relations, right? Now, do you guys remember from formal methods, what is the definition of a predicate? <laughs> oh, I see the wheels going. Uh, say it again. Ex excellent. It's a function that returns type Boolean. Remember that? And we did propositional calculus and then we did predicate calculus. And the definition of a predicate is a function that returns type Boolean. Now, what do you think this parent, Pam, Bob, is? It's a predicate. Are you with me? So it's either, it, it's either true or false. It's, it's a function that returns type Boolean. It's either true or false. In prologue, we will see that it's something that either succeeds or fails, which is closely related to true and false. Is everybody with me on this? So it's kind of like everything in prologue is a predicate. It's amazing that you can do so much with, with everything just being a predicate. So now what was the fundamental data type in LISP, in Scheme? What was the built in, the fundamental data type in scheme? Well, um, they were functions, but functions were lists. lists. Guess what in, in prologue? It's not, instead of being a list, it's a what? Predicate. It's a predicate. Everything, in the same way that everything in Lisp or scheme is a list, everything in what? Prologue is a predicate. So we'll be writing predicates. That's what we'll be doing. That's what. Are you with me? And and so when you whenever you say what you're saying, you know when when you query the database, you're saying, you know what makes this true? What 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 makes this function return true? How can this function return true? Okay. Well, that is the. Um, you know there is a situation where you do. And it's not always clear when you do and when you don't. So if you just always do it, that's what the philosophy there. But it is, it's the standard prologue convention. It's to have no space between the name of the predicate and the parentheses and have one and a leading space in front of the first. Uh, it looks kind of weird, but that's the standard way to do it. Okay, so let's, um, let's start seeing how Prologue works by doing a demo. Are you going to write it no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dis the the pro the programs that we're going to see are the question was am I going to write in VI or Vim, and the the functions that we um, are going to investigate in the database they're all pre pre written, so we're going to display them using more. Now look, you guys, for those of you who have uh, Linux and or Mac, which is Unix, um, you, it's really, really good for you to, get, to learn how to use the, the, um, the terminal, okay? Because this, all of this is standard Unix stuff. In fact, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of, uh, it's too bad that we have such good IDEs around these days, like, you know, like NetBeans and Qt and all that stuff, Qt, because you can do so much without going to the command line. But at this stage of your career, you really need to know how to le learn. You really need to know how to use the command line tools. You know, so I really encourage you to. to that's why one reason I, I encourage you to use VI is, is so that you can get familiar with using all these command line tools. So here's one. Here's one shell. And do you guys know what CD is? Change directory. So I have a directory called documents, a subdirectory called classes, another one called CS450. And do you know what LS is? List the, direct, list the files in the directory. And so um, these are all the ones. And then I have another one here called prologue. So I'll CD to prologue. And do you know what PWD is? Yeah, print working directory. So now this is the, see how I CD'd all the way down to classes and CS450 prologue. Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. 
And so now that I'm in prolog, these are all, and now here I did an LS. It scrolled off, but I did an LS. And now you see these are all, uh, some of these files are available to you um, online on the course webpage. And um, what, the one that we're going to look at is ch1.pl. So the extension is .pl. What was our extension with Dr. Raggett? RKT or something like that? So anyway, this is our, and so if I do, now do you know what cat is? It's, it's concatenate. Like if I concatenate chapter1.pl and chapter2.pl, <clears throat> then what it will do is it will list one out and then it concatenate it with the other one. So if I do that, boom, all the one and two all came out. But if I just do one, here's ls, if I just cat ch1.pl, that concatenates that one. But if I concatenate it, the problem is it scrolled off the screen. So do you guys know what more is? Yeah, it lets you do it a line or a screen at a time. So it doesn't scroll off the end of the screen. See, this is the kind of thing you really need to know in the Unix command line. This is just, I, yeah. You, there's lots of tutorials online. And, uh, Yeah, le yeah, I forget I forget what less is. And there's also head and tail. So here if you do if you do head of ch1.pl, that's the first 10 lines I think or something like that. And I forget what less is. I used to know what less was. I think it's the same as more. more. But watch what happens if I do more. If I do more ch1.pl, now what happens is it just it, when it gets to the bottom of the screen it doesn't scroll off the screen. And now there's two, you either press return to get one line at a time, like I'm doing now. Do you see how it's scrolling one line at a time? Or I press the space bar to get the next whole screen at a time. Okay, does everybody see that? And then of course you have the history. You know, you can do use the up arrow to do, um, you can use up arrow to get the previous commands, right? So here's our, here's our chapter one. Dot PL. So now does everybody see then that this is the content of chapter 1.pl and do you see up here that this is, these are the facts that we just looked at on the slide. Are you with me? Now we'll, oh, we'll, we'll do a, a, new, a new shell. So here's a new shell, a new instance of the terminal. And we'll drag it down to the bottom of half of the screen. So this is kind of like our our IDE, <laughs> you know, it's, this is like the Dr. Racket thing up here, you know, with this and the, what's the, and so now <coughs> what we'll do here is we'll CD to documents 450, um, was it prologue? Okay, now check this out. Um, let's go back to our, um, Let's go back to our slide here, to the next slide. So here's, here's what we're going to demo now. We're going to demo, oh, and by the way, the way all the instructions for downloading GNU Prolog, that's all on the web page, right? So you need, to, you need to install that. And there's, there's executables for Windows and Mac, no problem. So here's what we're going to, going to demo. We're going to demo the consult. We'll demo halt. We'll demo the semicolon, which is the next solution, and we'll demo A, which means all solutions, and we'll demo the return key to do stop. All right? So, watch this. First, how do you get into Prolog? <coughs> okay? So, here's the content of ch1.pl. Now, watch this. The way we, do, the way we execute gprolog is gprolog. Once you get it installed, that's how you get it in. Now, what, do you, what did it say here? And I pressed G, when I entered gprolog. GNU prolog 1.4.4 compiled. See, I just updated right before class. I was running 1.4.0, but like I say, this GNU prolog is really kept up to date really well, maintained very well. And, um, and Daniel Diaz uh, is the maintainer. And, um, and what do you notice the prompt is? Question mark hyphen. That's the prompt. It's asking for a query. Are you with me? 
Now, to read the thing that corresponds to our run in Dr. Racket, to read this in, it's, called, it's the consult command. Consult predicate, actually. So we say consult, um, and then space, and then single quote, ch1.pl, single quote, in the, oh, and notice how when I did the, um, notice that when I do the right paren, it shows me the corresponding left paren momentarily there. Isn't that slick? And then what do we always end, end with? Period. Period is right. And now watch what happens when I do this. And now you see what it said. It says compiling user work for documents at ch1.pl for bytecode. So there's a bytecode interpreter underneath the hood. And so many lines read, blah, blah, blah. And then this last little thing right here that says yes, that's saying, oh, we succeeded. The consult succeeded. So that was, that's that yes. All right. And now how do I quit? Halt, period. Don't forget the period. That's how you get out of G-Prolog. Are you with me? Okay. So let's go back into G-Prolog and consult. Quote, ch1.pl, quote, print, period, boom. Are you with me? Is everybody good? All right. Now watch this. Oh, and by the way, when it did the consult, do you see that it, it read in all these facts? All these facts are in the database. Now watch this. What do you suppose happens if I say parent, you're going to be maybe not too impressed at the beginning. Bob, Pat, what do you, th what is a predicate? A function that returns type of, so if I say parent, Bob, Pat, what do you suppose? Yes. Did you see that? Yes. And what if I say parent, parent, um, Liz, Pat, what do you suppose is going to happen there? No. Correct. No. And what if I say parent Tom Ben? No. Oops, Ben, B-E-N, right? That's also a no. And remember we said that these, uh, these constants, they're called atoms, are start with a lowercase. So here comes your first rule for GNU prolog, for, for, for prolog period. Uppercase identifiers that begin with uppercase are variables. Lowercase are atoms or constants. Are you with me? So check this out. The same predicate if I say x comma Liz. What am I asking? And not only does Liz have a parent, but if Liz does have a parent, what? No Boom. Oops. Wrong key. <laughs> oh, so much for that dramatic. <laughs> Boom. Look at that. Are you impressed? And not only that, but what, instead of coming back with the prompt, what, is it, what did it come back with? A question mark. And what do you suppose it's... It's, it's wanting you to do. Well, is there another parent? So now we do semicolon to get the next solution. Now in this particular case, there was no other parent. So when I press the semicolon, the answer is no. Is everybody with me on that? Are we good? Now how did it do that? How did it do that parent X Liz? What did it, you know, here, look up here. What did it have to do? What, do you suppose, what did it have to do? It had to find Liz on the right and then do what? Match the Tom with the what? With the X. Do you see that you didn't have to write a loop to do that? You didn't have to write a recursive thing to do, to do the search. What happened under the hood? It's all automatic. The programming's been done for you. Is that not a huge concept? Okay, and furthermore, what about this? What about, what about, what do you suppose we're asking here? Who is Bob the parent of? So how do we say that? Bob what? X. X. 
And what do you suppose is going to happen here? And is there another? And hmm, is there? Yeah. And so what's going to happen if I press semicolon? It'll give me the other one and then stop. Well, that's a good question, and I, there's not a simple, easy answer for that. And the, actually, the answer is I don't know, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, there's some little things, you know, there's some little things about this engine that are still not clear to me after all these years of using it. And that's one a little annoying thing that I never have been able to figure out yet. <laughs> Well, I, I don't want to, let, let's not dwell on that. It's too, it's too, okay. But now check this out. What do you suppose, look, if I can ask who is the parent of Liz, and, I, and, if, I, and if I can ask Bob is the parent of whom, who is the parent of whom? What would I do? X, X comma what? Y. y, parentheses, period. Now watch this. Boom. Pam Bob. And if I want the next one, what? Semicolon and Tom Bob. And if I want the next one, what? Semicolon, Tom Liz. And if I, now what, do you remember on the screen, what, what gave all of the ones? Was it A? It was A. So now watch, if I do A, watch what happens. It'll do them all. Now does everybody see that, how that A works, how that all works? Okay, and furthermore, oh, and here's another cool thing. I wish, I wish we had this in Dr. Rackett. Up arrow key, repeat the previous query. And one more up arrow, repeat the previous one before that, and so on and so on. Down arrow, go the other way in the history. So this is also something that's available in the bash shell, in the shell, you know, when you're on the command line in Unix. Okay, so, but, and now watch this. So if we do parent x, y, and I do semicolon, and I do semicolon. Now, do you remember what one of those other ones was? Was it the space or was it return that terminated? Which, what was it? Was it return? Here, let's press return. Boom. And see, so I, you can't see it on the screen, but I pressed return. And so that terminates, so that stops it right there without doing any more, seeing if there's any more solutions. Is everybody with me on this? Are we good? Okay, let's go back up to our slides. So we just demoed halt, semicolon, A, re return, and we saw how the programming is done for us. And now, you guys, let me ask you this. Figure 1.2 from the book. What makes a person a grandparent? Like, who is the grandparent of Jim? Yes, if X is the parent of Y and Y is the parent of Jim, then what? X is the grandparent of Jim. So how do I ask this? How do I do the query? How do I ask, the, how do I ask who is the grandparent of Jim? Well, we say who is the parent of Jim, Y, who is the parent of Y, X. So the query would be what? Well, I, 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 what, I, what we need to do is we need to understand this query. You understand what I mean by a query? The query is what you type in, you query the database, all right? And you query by writing uh, um, predicates. And, and, and so what, what has to be true, what has to be true for, to, to determine who the grandparent of Jim is? Well, we say parent Y Jim, and wh what will Y be? Y would get instantiated to what? The parent of Jim. And then we say parent XY, and then X will be instantiated to what? The parent of Y. So our answer will be X. Are you with me? And this is how we do the query. Does everybody see how that worked? So let's try it. Oops. Okay, so... Uh, see, what was that? Parent, parent, uh, was it parent Y, Jim? And then parent um, X, Y, is that right? 
and then period. And now what do you suppose is going to happen? Not only will it give us, not only will it give us y, it'll also give us the what? It'll give us the x, yeah. But we know that the answer that we wanted was the, no wait, did I say that wrong? Is y the one we want? X is the grandparent. X is the grandparent. But it gives us the intermediate as well, right? Is everybody with me on that? And then is there another one? No, there's not another one if I do semicolon. Is everybody good? Mm -hmm. And how would we say, who are Tom's grandchildren? Yeah, see if you can guess that. Who, who are Tom, how would you query, who are Tom's grandchildren? Let's go to our next slide. Who are Tom's grandchildren? Can you, how would you query that? Well, I mean, you could tell from this, from here, who are Tom's grand, who are they, actually? Oh, wait, grandchildren. Ann and Pat. Yeah? So, but how do we, qu I mean, we know the answer, but how do we query that? No, 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 we don't know Bob. We, we want Tom's grandchildren. We don't want to know who Bob is. I mean, we might not know who Bob is. It's Tom, we, we need to do it with just with Tom and some variables. So what's the query? Who are Tom's grandchildren? Parent Tom X, Parent Tom X and? Um, is there a period on the first one? Is it period no, it's comma, and comma is and. Okay. It's conjunction, okay. like conjunction. So then comma, um, parent X, X y. y. And then it would be the Y. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So parent Tom X and parent X, Y. Good. Is everybody, are we good? Let's try it. Uh, tell me what you're typing in. Parent, parent, um, Tom, X, parentheses, comma, parent, X, Y. So now check it out. Bob, Ann. So now it's giving us the Bob, but it's the Ann here, right? But and if I press semicolon, what? Oh, I, wrong key. I pressed the single quote. Oh, it says semicolon for next solution, A for all, return to stop. There's, that's a nice little message for us. So there's Bob Pat, and then there's no more. So the no means the last, after it did those two solutions, it failed. Is everybody good? And what do you suppose happens if we do it in reverse order? Parent X, Y, parent Tom X. What do you suppose? What should, I mean logically, what should happen? Yeah, it should be the same thing. So Bob Ann, Bob Pat, right? Are we good? Because it knows how to do those, it knows how to handle two variables in the parameters. Is that, are you with me? So there's, the, you, you can see that there's this search engine going on behind the scenes there. Okay, now, check this out. That first one that we did, parent Tom X, parent XY, there is a lot going on behind the scenes there. And the way that, the way that we, we there's, a, a, there's a trace feature that we can use to trace it. Watch this. We say, we say trace period, and when we say trace period, that turns the tracer on. And now what does it say? The debugger will first creep, showing everything, trace. All right, and so that yes means that we have succeeded in turning the tracer on. Now, if we do parent Tom X, um, parent X Y, and now when I press return, watch what happens, boom. Now, instead of giving us the answer right away, it's tracing it, okay? And look at what it's doing. It's saying, call parent Tom, now what is this underscore 279? No, that's just no. It, it's the internal name for the variable x. There might be two, there might, you, we might have to have multiple versions of x internally. So it's the internal variable name for x. Is everybody with me on that? 
And then every time, when I'm in the trace mode, every time I press return, I trace the next one. And then it says exit parent Tom Bob. And then it says call parent Bob 283. And then it says exit parent Bob Ann. And then, and then finally it gives us our answer. And now if I press, if I were to press return right now, what would happen? Do you remember what happened if I press return as a result of a, as from, from, a, from a question mark prompt? Yeah, it would quit the whole thing. So in order to get the next one, what do I have to do? Press semicolon. And now I'm back in the tracer, but when I'm in the tracer, when I'm in the tracer, you press return to trace through. You see what I mean? And then the semicolon will get the tracer again. And then the last one fails, and that's why we have a no at the end. Now, and now the way we turn the tracer off is no trace. Period. And now the debugger is switched off. But now what I want to do is I've taken that trace, all right, and I have reproduced the trace on the slides to show you how the trace, because I think, it, I think knowing how the trace works, tracer works, is really a good skill to have for debugging your prolog, your prolog programs. So let's, let's, go through, let's go through this trace and see what's, ha and see what's happening. Now, um, let's see, where is our, we kind of need, well, okay, so when we did, so when we turned the trace on, we said, it says parent Tom X, parent X Y, and it, the first thing it did was call parent Tom, was this the same number that we had on ours? Because they might be different, usually, I mean, it's some random number that you don't know what it is. Okay, so. So basically, so do you see what's happening? What it's doing is, we're, the, the thing that we're asking is parent Tom X, and so, it, and so it calls parent Tom, and then this 273 is, is the internal value for X. And then, and it succeeds, right? And it exits parent, and then it exits parent Tom Bob, and this, this exits one goal and calls the next goal. So exit means success. So when we go from this step to this step, what we're doing is we are succeeding here and we're going here. Do you see what I mean? Is everybody with me on this? These goals have to succeed from left to right. So the order matters. Are you with me? It's kind of like the concept of short circuit evaluation, you know, sort of. So what happens is, when in the trace, when it says exit parent, parent Tom Bob, what it did is it found that, that you know, it, it matched the Tom with Bob and it succeeded here. So exit one goal and calls the next goal. Exit means success, all right? Now, these numbers are, can, sound, can be a little mysterious. The first number is called the invocation number and that's unique for every invocation. And the second number is called the index number. And this is the number of direct ancestors of the goal. That is, it's the current depth of the goal. Now, the index, you'll see in a minute, we'll do another example in a minute, of, of, of the meaning of the index number, of, of how that changes, okay? And so now what it does is it calls, remember here, here the, the, the X Bob X got instantiated to Bob. So when we say parent X, Y, do you, see, do you see why Bob is here? Because X got instantiated to Bob here, and now, so X has the value Bob. You can think of X as having the value Bob. So when we call this parent, we're calling parent Bob and then a variable, all right? So the invocation number increases. So now we're working, um, so now we're working off of the invocation one, because we, what we've done is we've invoked another another rule here, uh, sorry, not another rule, another clause, another goal. Got to get my terminology right. The index number remains one because there's no direct ancestors of the goal and the current depth of the goal is one. You'll see what this means when we do the next example. And then what happens is it, it, does, the, it does that search, it searches for parent Bob somebody and it gets a match with Ann and so therefore it does X equals Bob, Y equals Ann and then asks us what to do next. Does everybody see how that worked? How 
it's like, it's called unification is the word for it. What happens is when we called, when we did parent Tom X, it, it matched Tom with one of those, well, we'll, we'll, see, we'll, 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 see late, we'll see later in more detail how that works. And now, what, did, did we do the redo? Did, did you notice the redo when we did that? So now what happens is redo indicates backtracking. Because see, we have a successful solution here, but now we're saying, is there another solution? And so in order to do another solution, it has to backtrack from where we are. So we're going to redo parent Bob Ann. See, that's where we left off. So, all right, so now redo indicates backtracking. And so then what it does is it, 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 it backtracked from here, and then it called parent Bob again, and it succeeded with Bob Pat. And then if we tried to do it again, it did a redo and an exit a call. And this last fail means there's no more solutions, and that's why it terminated with no. Does everybody kind of get the idea of how that works? Okay, so let me ask, let's take a look at this, uh, at our family tree here, and let's ask this question. Do Ann and Pat have a common parent? Here's Ann and here's Pat. Do they have a common parent? Yes. They do. We can see that. But how would we ask that? That's the question. How would we query if Ann and Pat have a common parent? How would you, how, can you think of how to do that? See, because now what happens is the whole, everything is in the specification. We're not worried how it's going to figure it out. We're going to have to figure out how to specify. Do you see what I mean? This is a big paradigm shift. So do, can you, you're, what do you think? With the same X. That's exactly right. So he, what he said was parent X and comma parent X Pat. That is amazing. Do you see, do you see, the, lo you see the, the, the logic behind that? Check it out. So let's do, what did you say? Parent X and, is that what you said? Is that what we had? Mm -hmm. And parent, same X, was it Bob? Pat, sorry. And look, Bob, that's the common parent. And if I press a semicolon, there's no more solutions. Does everybody see how that, how those, how that works? Okay. Now, those are facts, but Prologue is even, has even, there's more. Oh, there's one more thing that we need to do before we go on. And that is, um, we, oh, we have these predicates, male and female. Now, in our book by Bratko, he mixes them up like that. Female Pam, male Tom, male Bob, female Liz. But in G Prologue, you, these all have to be contiguous. Why do you suppose that is? So we have to have all the females together and then all the males together. So when you have a, a predicate that has a certain name, you have to you have all the definition, all the, all the instances of that, I mean all the clauses with that predicate, they all have to be together. Can you, can you see what you, can you think of why that would be, you'd want that to be the case? So exactly, it's for efficiency. Because if it knows that there's, that it, if it's looking for female, female, a match of female, and then once it gets to not a female, it would, if they're ordered like this on the right hand side, then it knows that it doesn't have to do any more searching. Otherwise it would have to search the whole thing. So that's kind of a requirement of the G prolog. I suppose there's some pre-processing that you could do to sort them, but anyway, G prolog requires us to, to do it like this. So there, that's a difference from what's in the book. Okay, but we have to be uh, careful with that, with G-Prolog. All right, now let me think. When's your next assignment due? Monday. Monday. So I think we didn't get to rules, but you can read about rules and we'll do, I think, I think you have to write, I think you might have to write a, f a rule or two. But um, 
So that's definition uh, defining by rules. Okay, but we'll, we'll take a look at that next time. So you guys have a great weekend in this new paradigm, this paradigm shift we were just making. All right, see you next time.